good evening everyone yes, yes danushi oh i just want to say i actually have some time okay you, how how yeah. long do you have like maybe 15 extra minutes okay okay awesome that's good uh yeah so good evening everyone thank you so much for joining us on a friday evening uh so today we have quite a heavy topic in mind we are talking about suicide prevention and suicide awareness so thank you all so much for joining us with us once again for this episode of the real talk so before we start our proceedings i would like to introduce you our moderator mihi she is a freelance computer and she will be uh, your moderator this evening so uh, talking about the panel we have a panel of very Uh, esteemed and distinguished guests with us today so um i don't think we need a lot of introduction for any of you so uh, to start off we have prabhashana prabhashana is a uh, internationally renowned activist even though they don't really mention that whenever we ask for credentials thank you so uh, and then we have uh, adli she is the assistant uh, center manager and she works at uh, shanti margam uh, we have nimaya she is the president of uh, suicide defied an organization combating suicide and spreading awareness on uh, suicide prevention and we also have uh, danushi so danushi is actually uh, working with uh, equal ground and she is currently in the us doing uh, a lot of brilliant work over there so uh, joining us shortly will be mr anil who is uh, the manager at ccc line the 1333 uh, hotline in sri lanka so without further ado i will just hand over the controls to mihi and we can start the proceeding mihi over to you hi everyone uh, i'm mihi and today we're going to be talking about suicide prevention in sri lanka so i would like to start with danushi and the first question i have for danushi is about the work you are doing both in the us and sri lanka in relation Can you hear me now that she I'm not sure if Yes, I can hear you now. Ah, okay. So, the first question I have for you is about your line of work. So, I want to give you I want you to give us a brief introduction about what you do and how your organization helps uh suicide prevention in queer, queer communities. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much for the question. And first off, I just want to thank thank um thank you all for actually like organizing this um because this is such a vital topic to talk about especially with regard to Sri Lanka. I mean in 2004 we were named like like top one of the top four countries, you know, for you know with high suicide rates and now it's not as high, but I mean it's still like I mean, you know, 28 29 is still not something that you can just like, oh yeah, we we've gone down. I'm mean, for a small country that's such a such such still such a big you know number. Um, 
with regard to you know the work that I do, um, my name again. I just want to like introduce myself, reintroduce myself. My name is Danushi Fernando. I use she hers pronouns, um, and I um, I am currently the director for LGBTQ and gender resources at Vassar College, um, where I direct the LGBTQ plus center and the women's center. Um, I do super enjoy the work that I do as an advocate and an activist, but my heart will always be in mental health work. Um, so I. I work in a, with pri the private practice and I also volunteer my time as a mental health clinician um, in the South Asian Queer Collective, which is um, um, a South Asian um, um, queer group um, based in New York City, but we also do a lot of work um, internationally. Um, and I also am the volunteer mental health um, person for Equal Ground Sri Lanka, which is a nonprofit that advocates for the rights um, of the LGBTQ plus population in, you know, in, in um, Sri, Sri Lanka. So as far as the work that I do, I just want to say I do the work I do because, because as a queer woman, uh, as a queer Sri Lankan woman, um, I was part of, you know, I am part of the statistics. Um, of you know when it comes to when when it comes to suicidal ideation when it comes to suicide attempts and before I actually like go into like talking about you know the work that we do I really want us to recognize the, the recognize the gravity of how how um, suicide um, affects our queer community. So I just want to like, you know, um, these numbers are actually based um, nationally, um, um, and nationally as, is, as, as in the US. So it is a fair assumption to say that these rates might be higher in Sri Lanka or similar. Um, so queer youth um, ser seriously complete, uh, contemplate suicide at almost three times the rate of heterosexual youth. Queer youth are almost five times as likely to have attempted suicide compared to heterosexual youth. Of all suicide attempts made by, my, by youth, queer youth suicide attempts were almost five times as likely to require medical treatment than those of heterosexual youth. In a national study, 40% of trans adults reported that they had made a suicide attempt and 92% of these individuals reported to have attempted suicide before the age of 25. Um, queer youth who, who, who come from highly rejecting families um, are eight and a half times more likely to have attempted suicide as queer youth who report no or low levels of family rejection. And, and, the, and each episode of queer victimiz victimization, such as physical or verbal harassment or abuse, increases the likelihood of self-harm, self-harming behavior by two and a half times um, on average. Um, and these are really, really heartbreaking numbers. And unfortunately, I have, and, and I keep saying this, I am, I, I am well aware of these numbers because I am part of the statistic. And, and it's so important, and I keep saying this because um, because I think it's so important for us to us to destigmatize what mental illness looks like, um, because oftentimes mental health clinicians are looked upon as these individuals who are here to like save people, not recognizing that we ourselves are humans. We go through this. We go through this journey, and we do the work. Oftentimes, we do the work that we do because we've experienced these, these things and we've gotten something out of, you know, got, gotten something out of therapy. So that's one of the reasons why I keep saying, this is like, you know, a statistic, this is what, you know, like mental illness looks like. And this is also, you know, where you can get help. It's important for individuals to understand that. With regard to the work that I do, um, it's really, I mean, it's interesting to see the similarities as well as, as the differences, because um, here in the US, I work at, a, at an elite institution, which is super queer friendly, um, and people feel really supported. But at the same time, when they come from families that have they, that, that where they've experienced conversion therapy or they've gone through like I mean they, they have families who basically disowned them they, these individuals have experienced um, you know so experienced um, time moments where they felt like they that 
suicide was the answer for them. And it, it's, it's heartbreaking again. Um, and as I was saying, like most of the queer students, I've queer students and queer clients that I work with have thought of had suicidal ideations or have had attempted suicide at some point um, um, in their lives. And it's, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a pro, it's something that, you know, we have to come to terms with. It is a reality. So when it comes to support, um, especially with regard to individuals who don't feel like they have family support that we what one of the things that i try to do in um at college and as a therapist is to make sure that they recognize they that they have someone to come to and to help them identify they help them identify community support even if it's not from family something that i always say is you know family like i mean you you yes you're born into a family but you can also choose your family and your chosen family can some can be a lot more powerful if they are the ones who are supporting you so that's um, absolutely something that i work with um, when it comes to um, when it comes to um, working with um, working with either South Asian um, individuals who are queer in the U.S. or American students, uh, American individuals who are queer in the U.S. queer here. Um, with regard to Sri Lankans, it's really interesting and it again heartbreaking because a lot of the phone calls that I've gotten um, through Equal Ground Sri Lanka have been queer individuals who who want to cure their queerness. And that is such a painful thing to hear um, because, and, and I've had several, even you know, after working with them for quite a bit, um, when they recognize that I'm not someone who, you know, I, I, we, we don't, you know, like we, we don't believe in conversion therapy. That's not the work we do. Um, I've had several individuals who stopped, you know, stopped talking, stopped seeing me rather, because they felt like there was no other option for them, but to, you know, but to kind of cure themselves. And if I'm not going to help them with that, then that's that there is no answer. And that, is just really, really saddening. Um, so again, it's it's working. It's 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 a it's a huge culture shift. Like um, I've had to. I'm working. One of the individuals that I'm currently working with is a Sri Lankan mother whose child is, you know, child is trans and is going through the transition process. And the mother is super baffled that this individual has severe depression. In the meantime, throughout the entire conversation, while this, while this, um, while the daughter was, you know, with me, um, kept misgendering them, kept using their dead name, and then you wonder, like, why? And then, but it still baffles them that this individual has depression. So just like making those connections, it's very difficult um, in in a culture in 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 a country like you know ours, unfortunately, because there's so much work to be done, and a lot of the preventative measures that need to be done through schools, through our government. Um, you know, it's difficult for us to do when like being a part of the queer community is considered a criminal offense. And, you know, we have such a stigma, not just around mental health, but, you know, around queerness. So it's a double, it's, it's a double edged sword for anyone who's part of the queer community and who's suffering mental illness. Um, and just the vernacular around like suicide, the fact that our default is always, oh, this person committed suicide. Like that act that, I mean, that the words that hurt because, you know, suicide is not a choice. It's, it's the end result of, of, of an illness. Like, like any, you know, any, any disease, the, when I left untreated, you end in death. So this mental illness, if you don't treat it, you do end, you know, end with death. And that's something that we need to kind of, you know, um, recognize and teach. And that's, that's the work that I've been doing heavily with a lot of my Sri Lankan um, youth and a lot of my, a lot of my, um, my um, South Asian um, queer youth who, who are still stuck on, you know, mental health being such a stigma. 
Right. So uh, thank you so much. And also, I have to mention that I'm really, really, really happy that you brought up that you were a part of the statistic because that's something that we need, we need to understand because, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes for you to be part of the whole and you know exactly what you're going through and you know that you've been through it and you're trying to help other people. And I think that's very, very, I mean, very, very brave of you. Uh, can you tell us about the queer-friendly mental health services in Sri Lanka right now? Uh, oh, and is there capacity in them? Um, I, I didn't hear the last part, Nihi. So is there a scarcity in the mental health services for queer in Sri Lanka? Right. I mean, I know that, I mean, with, I know Equal Ground Sri Lanka has, you know, free mental health services. I do also, I'm, pre, I'm, I'm very sure that Shanti Margam um, is Rahu, this, which is, you know, organized by one of, one of my dear friends, um, um, actually has um, queer friendly resources. Um, and those right. are two organizations that I do know provide um, provide mental health resources. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, again, like the stigma around being queer, Mihi, like kind of stops us from getting the, getting the, getting the help required. And it's, 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 it's it, like, I mean, I mean, I know, like, I mean, with, with the individuals that I've been working with that it is scarce, especially when it comes to rural areas in Sri Lanka. Like, I mean, living uh, the urban experience, like being in Colombo or Candy um, as a queer person might be so, is not might, is so different from someone who lives in, in a rural part of Sri Lanka. And I am very happy that a lot of the people that I'm working with right now are from rural parts of Sri Lanka. Um, so I get that opportunity. So this is just absolute scar. It's absolutely like, I mean, I mean, it's just not something that you talk about because again, like, you know, suicide is one thing. They're still trying to like, like navigate their queerness and trying to make that connection because they don't see it still that, you know, there are sometimes, you know, the fact that you are not seen as, you know, I mean, you, you see, being seen, you seeing yourself as not normal, is like giving yourself so much like, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much mental illness related to that. And that's like something that is, you know, a, a lot of that takes a lot of unpacking. So unfortunately, yes, urban areas might be different, but you know, it's absolutely scarce. And the fact that it's still, you know, considered, you know, considered such a stigma to be part of the queer community stops us from getting the resources. Like, do we have schools that, provide you know provide support for our queer youth i don't think so do i'll, I'll provide Prabhasha, you said that, that we do have or do we do we not uh, no i was just agreeing with you that okay. schools are quite like horrible when it comes to especially right 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 and that that's the thing and like one of the main ways of providing support and preventing suicide if you look at any like you know go from who to any legit organization one of the most way, best ways to prevent suicide press, uh, pre prevent um, uh, prevent suicide prevention is through school based resources and we are not providing either and that's 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 a huge miss on, on our part, but again, it's a, it's a culture shift and I don't know when, I mean, we, in the US, we are regressing right now. Um, so it's, 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 it's difficult. It's, it's, a, it's, such a, it's such a culture shift to like see, see people as human, like, I mean, see, like, I mean, sexuality, it's not like sexuality, gender orientation. These are not like things that we should be like, you know, be like, make making such a such a deal about because it's you're at the end of the day you're human and it's just so sad that we are like so into prejudice and it, it's really heartbreaking Daniel he is now on board with us on the call I'm sorry that is just for the introduction he is the manager of the CCC lines it's one double three Triple three, sorry, one triple three mental health line. So hi, Mr. Anil. Hi. Hi, and uh, thank you for being here with us today. Nice to be here. Sorry, I was late. That's okay, and uh, thank you for joining us now. Uh, now I'm going to go back to Danushi for a little bit. 
Um, so the next question, Danushi, is actually about some stings that you not should not say to a queer suicidal individual. Because, see, here's the thing. There are people here in Sri Lanka that don't really understand the concept of queerness. Most of them don't. So the, they want to learn more, but they don't know how to. And if they do encounter someone who's suicidal and queer, what should you not say to them? Do they know that they're queer? So if they do, I mean, like, say a potential case where they do know it's a queer, queer individual and also being suicidal, right? what should you not say to them? That's, and that's, that's an interesting thing. Like, I mean, again, it like, depends on, like, what, like, I mean, how this individual, like, I mean, like, like the, the one thing is, like, saying, I mean, either negating your queerness and saying, oh, yeah, like, I mean, the only, like, negating your queerness or saying, oh, you're, you're feeling this way because you're queer, yeah. because you have this. And that's, that's a very common thing that I've had. Oh, you're going through, yeah, I mean, you want to kill yourself because you're, because, you know, you're feeling, you're, you're queer. Like, I wish you, I wish I could help you, like, you know, be, like, I mean, like, I mean, work on that or be, be normal. Like, I mean, that, that not, the word normal, I hear that so often with, like Sri Lanka, queer Sri Lankans who are trying to, you know, navigate their queerness because they don't feel like they don't feel like they belong. And like, I mean, that's something that I feel like is so essential for anyone who, re because the fact that that individual is at that vulnerable position and reaching out to you, like saying, hey, I'm feeling this way. And if at that juncture, the, the, the best you could do is, hey, I think you're feeling this way because, you know, you're queer. That just complete, that, I mean, that is just, that, I mean, that itself is like, okay, I mean, this is why I want to hurt myself. So I guess, you know, this, I mean, there's no way out. And I've had, like, I'm, I've had so many individuals, like, I mean, in wor working, who, who I worked with, who have, like, had those thoughts who felt like, okay, I mean, might as well, might as well, like, you know, I mean, why do I, why should I, why do I exist? Because I know this is, this is how, this is how it's going to be. Right. So that was basically what I wanted to know from you, Danushi, because there are people who want to know and want to help people, but there are people who don't know how to help them, especially when it comes to being queer, because I don't think everyone gets the concept of it. So thank you so much for your insight on it. And uh, that was my final question for you. And um, I hope you have a really nice day. And I hope that everything that you're doing with regards to uh, suicide prevention goes really well. And we are really, really proud of you for your initiative. And we hope you have a really nice day. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for doing the work that you're doing because it's so essential in a country like ours. And, and I know how hard it is, you know, doing the work that you do. So thank you. Thank you so much, Danushi, and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I am going to move to Adley, who is the assistant center manager uh, for Shanti Marga. Uh, hi, Adley. Hi. Hi. It's lovely to have you on board today. Glad and, to be here too. Uh, before we start on our questions, would you mind giving us a brief introduction into Shanti Margam and how uh, they evolved so far and what they do right now? Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is, reintroduction, my name is Adli Mohammed. Uh, I am a counselor and the assistant center manager at Shanti Margam. Uh, Shanti Margam is a youth center that focuses on the emotional well-being of youth and adolescents. And uh, there are two areas of work that we work in. One is community outreach, uh, which is we work with communities of uh, low socioeconomic background. Um, areas we work with are Vanatamulla, Gothamipura, and Obesekarapura. Um, the other area is counseling. Uh, we offer free uh, counseling at the center. And also we have a hotline that runs uh, eight hours. Uh, that's from 8 to 8 p.m. where uh, the phone is answered by a counselor. So if you need to talk to someone, uh, you can call the hotline or else we refer them to uh, CCC line or uh, other organizations that also uh, work with mental health. Um, and Shanti Markham is an inclusive organization that uh, welcomes uh, anyone from any religion, gender, 
sexual identity, anybody, like you, we work with uh, everybody. Right, thank you Adli for that introduction. So the first question I have for you is a very basic question. It's, it's what we think of first when we think about suicide prevention. And this is, what are the basic warning signs of suicide? Right. Um, and so basically, us? yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, I guess monitoring somebody, you know, uh, if there are lots of mood changes uh, that they have, um, if people are isolating themselves or withdrawing, um, if the way they speak has a lot of, uh, how do you say, emptiness and despair in how they speak, usually if they talk about, like, let's say we're talking about something uh, interesting that's going on, and their response to it could be very negative, could be very, uh, you know, very to do with a very low mood. Um, also, uh, they might be even uh, talking to you about that. Um, they may be agitated uh, and they will also lose interest in daily activities. Like if a person, let's say, uh, takes a jog in the morning every day or has a routine, they stop doing that. And things that they like doing, maybe hanging out with friends or whatever it is, they start losing interest in pleasurable activities as well. Um, another thing is, well, if you have a friend, let's say, or somebody that you know, right, uh, has things that they collect or something that brings them joy, uh, they start giving stuff away. Um, things that they have, you know, found that they really like for a long time if you paid attention and it doesn't matter to them anymore. Um, and last but not least, I think this is something, yeah, yeah, exactly. That we miss is when somebody has been having these, uh, you know, these warning signs that I said, like maybe for a couple of weeks or so, and they've been really low and all of a sudden their mood changes. Uh, they're in a really good mood and, you know, they spend time with family and friends. That is a red flag because if a person has been having these signs and if overnight there's a change in their mood, most likely they have already planned what they're going to do, how they're going to end their life and when they're going to do it. So people tend to miss that thinking, oh, he was feeling down all this time, but he's okay now. So paying attention to signs like that is important. That was really helpful because everyone who wants to find out whether another person is going through suicidal tendencies can now identify through these signs if they are actually going through something like that and we can be more empathetic towards them. So my next question to you, Adle, is uh, what age group is suicide in Sri Lanka prevalent in and why? Um, starting from adolescence all the way to uh, youth that is even, even in, into their late 20s or close to their 30s. Um, I guess because developmentally, when you, let's say if they start from the age of, let's say 12, 13, right? Um, those are the ages that uh, even kids, when you take, they start um, creating their identities and learning to make decisions. So it's a very important, vital time of their life. And likewise, as they get older, that those are the times that people uh, start working, doing their higher studies, uh, relationships, marriages. So those, uh, it, it's, it's like a crucial time period from that uh, spectrum when you see, because a lot of things are happening in your life, right? And you, there's a lot of decision making that comes in. So because of that, it can also be very overwhelming and very stressful. And this, depending on the support system that people have or don't have, um, can attribute to one feeling suicidal. Right. So my next question is going to have to go to Mr. Ranil. And uh, this is about the mental health line that he works in. And... Could you first give us an introduction to the mental health line, the one triple three mental health line, and what sort of suicide ca suicidal cases do you encounter on like the most most actually? Uh, well, uh, thirteen thirty three is been there from two thousand nine. Uh, we are under the foundation uh, CCC Foundation. Uh, CCC stands for Courage, Compassion, and Commitment. Um, so we have two two projects. One is with Tapeksha Hospital, and the other one is on mental health. Uh, so thirteen thirty three was initiated, like I said, in two thousand nine, and now uh, uh, it's uh, it's a toll free number. Uh, so you don't get charged for any call. Uh, it's hundred percent confidential. We don't take any personal details, no names, numbers, addresses unless it's a suicide call. Um, plus, it's uh, 
24 hours. So we are right now the only 24-7 toll-free number. Uh, we worked very closely with Shanti Margam. Actually, in 2018, we did a walk for Shanti Margam and CCC line. Adli was part of that as well. Um, so we are we, we don't go as a mental health number, like uh, was mentioned earlier, because of the stigma attached to mental health and suicide. We go as a crisis support service. And uh, every, every person who works for us is a volunteer. Uh, we have over 80 volunteers. All of them uh, go through a training, a five-day training. And uh, so they are trained uh, people who are willing to listen and support. So 1333 is, like I said, toll free, 24 hours, and in all three languages, and it's uh, confidential. Right. So uh, one more question for you, Mr. Daniel, is that what are the current statistics you hold with regard to suicide when it comes to 1333? Well, in Sri Lanka, the current statistics are, uh, it's... Uh, Per day, we have uh, about 10 to 12 suicides reported. The reason why I say reported is uh, there are suicides that go unreported as a suicide. They go down as an accident uh, because of the stigma attached to suicide, because is what the family has to go through and all that. Uh, so right now, that is the current statistics. And as Adli says, it's, it's a second... Uh, Second highest reason for adolescent death, uh, youth death in Sri Lanka. Uh, we are, I don't know, maybe in the top 15. Uh, we were number one in the 90s uh, in suicide. Uh, so most of the suicides are among males. and uh, But most of the calls we receive are from females. And uh, one of the main reasons why we get calls are not for financial needs. It's for loneliness and relationship issues. Uh, so we get about uh, 9,200 calls, uh, 9,200 crisis support calls a day. Of course, we get about 400, 480 calls a day, which is for other other stuff like, you know, some are nuisance calls, but some are for general information. But for actual ca counseling calls, we get about 9,200 uh, calls per day. Right. So you said that most females are the ones who are call, calling, uh, one, uh, 1333, sorry. So why do you think that lesser males call, but there are more suicides prevalent in males? That's actually a very good uh, question. Uh, in, in Sri Lanka, one of the main, not, not just Sri Lanka, mainly yeah. Asian countries, even around the world, uh, men are supposed to be macho, you're supposed to be strong, you're supposed to have a strong uh, outlook to life. Even as a kid, if a boy falls and starts crying, what do we say? Why are you crying like a girl? Boys don't cry. Right? Boys don't cry. Yeah. Why are you crying? Only girls cry. What is this you're wearing? Only girls wear this. Uh, why can't you ride a bike? Uh, you can't. So we are, we are under the pressure uh, of, you know, carrying the weight and if we show emotion, then it's a weakness. So men don't call, men don't talk about their problems. Like I was, uh, I was with uh, Randi yesterday, and he's he's running a campaign uh, for men to come out and talk about their problems, uh, where, because it's a huge issue. And and suicides are high among men. Women are stronger, and they call. They call, they seek help, they'll, they'll talk to somebody and they'll seek help. But men won't. Because again, if a man goes and says, hey, I'm going through the problem, the person who's listening will say, are you mad? Ah, I mean, pull your socks up, tighten your waist, ah, be a man. That's what they're going to say. That's what the general so, perception is. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's our culture that has you know, put this label. And because of the label, there's a huge weight men have to carry. Right. So thank you so much for that. So we are going to switch to Prabhashana now. Hi, Prabhashana. And we're going to go back to talking about queer suicidal individuals. 
Uh, would you mind giving us the suicide rates of queer persons in the country? And earlier when we spoke, you said that there was uh, no actual, you know, evidence. You know, the evidence on that was so, scarce. That. So even though in Sri Lanka we have these suicide statistics, one of the main problems we have faced is that uh, suicides of queer persons get swept under the rug and not get reported because they don't specifically want to mention or specify that the cause of suicide was stress or bullying caused because of their gender, sexual orientation or identity. So it's kind of hard to put a number on it because I know for a fact um, I've lost people that I know um, to unfortunate situations where they thought that was the option, but um, I, even in their cases, their reports only ask people who we, who knows them, knows that the reason behind it. Right, so there, are there any suicide rates of queer persons reported in the country at all at the moment? I mean, um, I'm pretty sure CCC line and um, um, yeah, CZ Lane uh, has kind of an idea about like how, how many queer people are feeling that type of way and give you a general estimation. But compared to the lack of education, exposure, that is not at all something that we can um, comprehensively put, in, put to like the entire country, I don't believe so. Right. So, Prabhashna, when we earlier spoke through WhatsApp, you said that there was a connection between sexual wellness and mental health. So, I believe, I personally believe that sexual wellness of queer pe persons need to be, like, on a good level for them to have a good he health in their, I mean, mental health as well. But then, what do you think, personally, is the connection between mental health and sexual wellness? Okay, so what I see is that sexual health is just as stigmatized as mental health because sex itself is stigmatized when we're in a um, conservative country. So if you get an STI, it's just like any other illness, right? But the act of sex or being sexually active is so, um, something that they've Put, it, put this narrative on to think that it's something that you should be ashamed of, it kind of doubles down on the mental health of someone when um, they aren't necessarily well sexually. And um, it kind of, um, so one of the things that we've encountered is that people tend to not go into um, STD clinics or get themselves checked or um, yeah, even um, make sure even your sexual health. Gynecologist. Yeah, so yeah, they're afraid of finding something or being afraid of having some kind of sexual health issue. That would end up, end up causing them some kind of um, state of uh, pressure. Right, so my next question is going to go to Nimaya. This is the first question for you. Um, I would like you to introduce yourself and just define, I mean, about your organization, uh, what is Suicide Defied and what do you guys do? Would you mind giving us a brief introduction about that? Yeah, okay. Um, so, hi, I'm Nimaya and I'm probably um, basically the least um, the least important person here in terms of qualifications and such because I am obviously nowhere there matched. Nothing like that. I mean, you don't have to have qualifications to yeah. want to help other people. So, so um, basically, the organization uh, I'm the president of Suicide Defied, and the organization is a mental health and suicide prevention uh, organization that was started by young people in order to help other young people who are going through uh, mental health issues as well as suicidal tendencies. So what we do as an organization is first of all, we kind of make sure that there is an awareness uh, and there is 
um, information that is available to especially young people who might not know what they are going through or might not identify the fact that there could be something wrong. Um, and we also basically create a platform which allows not only for these like young people to feel understood and to feel as though they have someone who understands them, but also it allows for young people who are going through mental health issues to kind of partake in awareness and allows them, them like they themselves to feel as though they are part of the awareness program and feel as though they are part of uh, the overall awareness of mental health in Sri Lanka. Um, we are also affiliated with the CCC Foundation and um, we do provide the necessary information and necessary numbers of you know, counselors and other, um, other institutes that do provide uh, counseling and other information to make sure that the young people that we reach do understand that there is help and that they can get help. Right. So that was, that's really brave of you and we congratulate you on your steps and we hope that Suicide Defy goes a long way. So let's talk about what measures are being taken by Suicide Defy to reduce suicide rates in Sri Lanka. So um, one thing that, um, the good thing about the fact that we are an organization run by young people for young people is the fact that we are able to kind of reach a lot of people that might not be looking to follow organizations that are like, or like far more, you know, far more large scale organizations like Shanti Margam, like the CCC Foundation. Um, certain people, because of the stigma that we've been talking about, might not want to be reached by these organizations because they do not want to feel weak or feel like they need any form of intervention and because we have a board and we have a um, organization full of young people we're able to make sure that these awareness posts and these awareness activities and projects get shared on a much larger scale to a younger audience of like younger people from so like people in school that might not be seeing these awareness posts and might not be seeing these um you know these um the relevant information that they would have seen if they were actively searching for it or actively uh, like okay with understanding mental health. So because we are able to reach people, we are able to reach not only, um, we're happy to say that we're not only reaching, you know, young girls or girls who are like more likely to want help or want to understand themselves. But we are also very happy to note that at least half of our board is consisting of young boys who are willing to help us share this message to other boys to make sure that this message and this idea of mental health and you know awareness of the mental health issues that are going around um, reaches them so that they themselves don't feel as though they have to kind of pent up this like feeling. Also, we have a constant, um, what is it called, an anonymous, um, messaging service, the, uh, we have a link in our bio at all times, which allows basically anyone and everyone to anonymously share anything they need to talk about, any information they want us to give and make sure that if, this inf if we are able to see these anonymous messages that there won't be any private information and they won't feel any sense of shame or any sense of, you know, um, you know, stigma because we make sure that it is anonymous and their problems are dealt with in the fashion of anonymity. So, yeah. That's really great. Uh, thank you so much, Nimaya. And my next question is going to be directed to Adle again. Uh, one thing we notice when we talk about suicide prevention is that the environment that a person can exist in really affects their mindset and how they look at things in their life. So what can we do to make the environment less toxic and safer for suicidal individuals? Okay. Um, first off, well, I'd like to just say something as to what Rani was saying earlier as to why there, there is more suicide when it comes to, as in men rather than women, but women reach out. Um, fortunately, I guess, because women are told that, you know, it's okay to cry, it's okay to feel. And unfortunately, it's the opposite for a man. So hence the discrepancy as to the numbers between two genders. And as uh, Prabhashana was saying, um, 
I think uh, suicide is looked at uh, also as uh, society looks at sex. Don't talk about it, it won't happen. So that's something uh, we need to change and know that it's okay to talk about suicide. Um, going back to your question, uh, Mihi, uh, the environment, well, of course, it depends on each individual. Um, depending on what their family background is like, what their homes are like, um, triggers can vary as to where they are at. Sometimes the triggers could be at home. So uh, making it less toxic could be as a friend if you're helping somebody, identifying that where do these thoughts of suicide come from to that person? What are uh, his or her triggers? Uh, is it important to remove that person from uh, that environment that's causing them that? Or what can, as, as an individual, as, as let's say you for a friend or a family member, what you can do to help them make it easier in the environment that they are in? And uh, if you are to approach somebody and, and you know that, and if they have actually told you that this is what I plan on doing, uh, making sure that the availability of what they hope to do isn't available. So um, uh, we don't talk about methodology because we don't want to, uh, you know, <clears throat> how to say, uh, add to what's going on and giving people ideas. It's, it's more of like, if you know somebody has told you a plan that this is how I'm going to do it, then as a friend or family member, making sure that those things are not av available for that person. Um, and also basically listening to what they're going through. Like I said, it depends on each case for what their environment is like. So in order to remove them from that, a person who is there helping them, listening to them needs to be able to understand what they're going through. And through that, uh, you'll be able to help somebody, you know, get out of that environment or make it a safer place. I, I hope that answers the question. Mickey. It does. It does. Exactly. So that's what I was thinking of because we are we think that we are being good to a person when actually we're doing something that might trigger them. So it's important to understand what sort of mindset that the person is in before we act or say something. Uh, my next question is for Prabhashana again. I want, so Dhanushi and I briefly discussed this, but uh, I don't think there was enough context on this. So we just want to go back to this. Why is there a lack of awareness on mental health services for LGBT youth? And how do you think we can bridge that gap? So, um, again, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a lot of these interconnection uh, to the issues, right? So queer people, most of the time struggle trying to ident like find their identity and trying to find who are they and what they're feeling. Um, a, a brief discussion that I had with a couple of other community organizers, um, what I heard was that when someone starts identifying as queer, um, their families would um, send them to religious figures or counts, the quote unquote counselors that they, the, those families would think could help. But because of the already existing stigma around sexuality and queerness, especially for trans and, uh, and queer kids, one of the things that these people do is make them feel guilty about how they're feeling. Right. So shaming them into a most uh, such like such a state would kind of break them apart from the inside. So that is one reason. And the other being um, the adult queer people, especially if they are visibly queer, have a hard time finding um, employment or housing because they get rejected and discriminated. So the ability to access um, mental health services, even though the government does provide mental health services, uh, something that is queer friendly and something that actually helps them is quite hard. So that is why I believe that there's a huge lack of awareness when it comes to the queer community and mental health. Okay, thank you, Prabhashana. Um, I would like to direct my next question to Mr. Anil again. Um, let's talk about the movements that you are currently taking to prevent suicide in Sri Lanka. It's very 
it's very educational things you are doing right now and i would like you to tell tell the people who are watching uh what the steps are being taken for suicide prevention through the 1333 mental health line which thing and see 1333 can't do this on their own right that is why we need we need partners we need people supporting us right. like uh, suicide defined has also collaborated with us and uh, it's they are they are, they are an amazing group i mean it's lovely to see young people taking this challenge up and uh, taking the message out there uh, there are other organizations uh, like uh, light uh, then so many organizations who who want to do this so uh, it's a it's a it's a group uh, it's a team effort um, right now we are focus uh, mainly on awareness because uh, we don't get too much of air time i'm sure out of the six people who are in this group at least one wouldn't have heard about 1333 uh, if you have i am rather than really surprised uh, because there is not much glamour in in what we do you know there is not much money to be made or glamour in this so we do this because we are passionate uh, we do this either we have a personal experience or we have a loved one or a friend who has gone through this and uh, we are trying very hard there are few channels uh, who have helped us in the past uh i know chocolate has done uh, a lot i remember last year even after we finished our ride they did a write up in your magazine uh, we have some amazing people from chocolate who are volunteering uh, with us and i'm sure they are smiling right now <laughs> the amazing people who have been a part of 1333 and who are uh, who are taking on huge responsibilities for 1333 from chocolate so that's amazing Uh, we are planning on releasing a app uh, right now uh, 1333 is in, in sri lanka uh, we cover all parts of the island it's toll free but now we are going into a app so the first stage of the app will be only chat where young people you know will have it easier to access we will have the same professionals on the chat app uh, who will answer uh and after that we want to have a um, you know through internet where they can dial because we have a lot of people overseas sri lankans who want to call, talk to a sri lankan based service service right? we have seafarers the nuss who is partnered with 1333 they are requesting that we have a, a line uh, where the the seafarers on board of ships can call us so right now only their families or when they come to sri lanka they can dial that in that way so we are looking into that uh, then we have upgraded our website uh, so we are looking at that uh, so we are we are trying to do a lot of things we are trying to expand the call center because right now the the the, the, the number of people number of crisis supporters who can answer us are limited so we want to expand that uh, so a lot of things we are doing and and soon i will be meeting with suicide defied and uh, light to see what we can do in the next 3 months to actually take out the word for uh, to for people to know about the services that are there now with people like uh, uh nimaya who are you know very versed with social uh you know media and all that they can help us take the message to facebook instagram and i don't know what else is out there right and uh, and we are also going to approach the minister of media uh we have people who are passionate about that who will help us to uh, reach certain levels of government i know the president is very passionate about this so we want to talk to him and within the next few months we want to do something drastic uh, and change uh, one of the things we do we did uh, at least it ended yesterday on the 10th of september which is world suicide prevention day is the bike ride we do every year 
uh, we do a bike ride for 1,333 kilometers, covering 13 cities in 13 days. Um, so it ended up yesterday at Independence Square, and uh, Adley was there, right, to share the riders. And we had a walk yesterday called Let's Talk and Walk. Uh, so we do that every year. Then we are planning on doing another walk uh, next year. Uh, the first walk we did was partnering with Shanti Margam called Footsteps to Freedom. We did it. Uh, we did a walk for 73 days. Myself, Nivendra, and Sara, and of course Adley joined us whenever time permitted. Adley and her husband. Uh, so. 1,400 kilometers in 73 days. So the next walk is going to be close to 700 kilometers from Dondra to Pedro. That is also creating awareness on suicide prevention, on you know, on on people being treated fairly. Everybody, you know, everyone being treated fairly. Uh, so that is one thing. And and one of our big major programs that we have already come out is called Let's Talk. Let's talk is letting everyone talk safely. And uh, talk is tell, acknowledge, uh, listen, and keep in touch. And so we are, we are planning on uh, releasing it into schools. And we are already started with corporates. Uh, in schools, we are doing it free of charge. But corporates, we are charging. IFS and MAS have already come on board. There are other organizations that are discussing with us. So those are the things that are happening. And uh, yeah, we just want to get the word out. We, we, I mean, it's okay if people don't call us, but people need to know that they have options. Like, like Shanti Margam, like 1333. Uh, and another good organization that wasn't mentioned here is Grassrooter. Right? Grassrooter uh, yeah. is an amazing organization who works with uh, LGBTQ community, who works with HIV patients, who, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful work. Uh, you can visit their website. It's bakamuno.lk. Right? Completely uh, informative, a super website. Uh, so yeah, there are there are a lot of things happening. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Ranil. And I love that you elaborated on the other mental health services that we could uh, take use of and introduce to our friends as well. Uh, my next question is going to Nimaya. Uh, this is basically something that we need to understand when it comes to suicidal individuals. Um, empathy is something that's important when it comes to understanding people and then uh, it's the first step to knowing what they're going through. So what would you personally say is the way to be more empathetic towards suicidal individuals? Okay, so uh, you were right, obviously, about the whole um, empathy being a very big part of helping people, not only who have suicidal tendencies, but also helping people with mental health issues. Um, I feel like the easiest way in which you as a human being can propagate or continue to build your empathy is the easiest, it's a saying, basically, just to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And every single time you speak to someone, every single time you may feel like this person is going through something, or even if you do not know if they are or are, or are not, you, I always say that it's far better to treat every single person as if they are going something that you do not know about. It's always better to treat people with a level of kindness and respect regardless of whether or not you yourself know that they are going through something or not. Because Mental health is something because of the stigma, because of maybe personal shame, and maybe because the reasons behind their mental health are private issues. People don't always, you know, publicly announce it. People aren't going to walk into schools or walk into their classrooms or walk into, you know, their office, wherever, and yell, oh, I'm depressed, or I have an issue, or this and that. But the best way in which you treat people with empathy is to always treat them as if you yourself, as if you want to be treated. Because if you have an issue, it's very unlikely that you will be telling every Tom, Dick and Harry about your issue. It's always better to treat people as the way you want to be treated and just overall treat people with kindness and respect, regardless of what you think they're going through. Because what happens a lot of the time is that um, 
people, we, it's actually a noted thing when it comes to especially younger people is that a lot of people who are going through mental health issues or are suicidal are less likely to maybe outwardly show the signs. Like they're less likely to, you know, blatantly be upset in class or blatantly show regressive signs. Because when you look at a lot of people and out of just pure, um, you know, experience, personal experience, you see that a lot of them are more likely to kind of cover their emotions or hide it with this facade of happiness or facade of it doesn't bother me. So as an individual who might not be going through something, you might look at someone and assume because they're always happy or because they always seem to have this joyful persona that they are not going through anything. And therefore you, are, you won't treat them as if there's something wrong. So it's always better as an individual to just treat people with kindness and treat people as though they are going through something that requires you to treat them with a level of respect and a level of understanding to the way in which they're acting. Uh, because um, it's also a noted thing that if you, the thing is when you disregard someone and when you say, oh, what do you mean you're sad? You're always happy. Your family background is great. You, you have a wonderful family, wonderful friends. Why would you ever be sad? when you disregard people's emotions because of what they present to you or what they present outwardly, what you're doing is you're just basically creating that sense of self-hate or creating this guilt within a lot of people into others or feeling as though, Hey, I, I don't, I have no reason to feel this way. Why am I feeling this way? It's I'm, I'm being ungrateful. I'm being selfish. It just kind of creates more of a churning feeling of self-hate and which could obviously lead to worse mental health deprecation. So always treat people as if they are going through something regardless of whether you know they are or are not. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nimayat. That was really great. And uh, so one more thing. What advice would you personally give a person battling with helping a suicidal individual? So let's say I'm a friend of somebody and I want to help someone who is suicidal. How do I help them? Okay, so it honestly depends on the individual and depends on the situation. You can't generalize every individual based on like saying, oh, they have depression, they are suicidal, therefore I must take these exact measures every single time. Because different people will react to different forms of, you know, uh, human interaction differently. Some people, um, for example, if an individual isn't the most affectionate, isn't the most, you know, um, social or isn't very fond of human interaction, if you were to hound them constantly, be like, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? checking up on them constantly, it could overwhelm them. It could honestly make it worse because you are overwhelming them. You are, it's a sensory overload. So in situations where the person does not want to talk about it or does not feel comfortable with you, I feel like the best thing to do in that situation is just to make it known to that individual that you are there for them. Just to make it known to the individual that if they were ever to need you, if they were ever okay and comfortable enough to talk to you, that you will be there to talk to them. Not to constantly be like, please tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, because that would honestly drive a lot of people away and make people less comfortable to talk to you. So if you are a friend talking to an individual, obviously, who you might believe is going through something, the, your best bet is just to establish a sense of trust, establish a sense of you know, I'm there for you and make sure that this person feels comfortable with you. And when you have reached that level of you be that person being comfortable with you, then you just have to establish that feeling of I'm not pushing you. I'm not prying into this feeling that you're having. I'm not trying to, you know, convince you, yell at you, belittle you in any way. I just want to listen. If you establish the fact that you as a friend, not as a professional person trying to you know psychoanalyze their brain or anything but as a friend who are attempting to listen to their problem it is very likely that this person when they are comfortable if they do want to speak to you will speak to you or will open up to you in some way some shape or form but then there's obviously the secondary um, situation when this person is willing to talk to you is 
a person who requires this emotional or physical connection or physical affection. In that sense, in that situation, obviously, some people, some people, honestly, what I say is that some people genuinely need just a hug. Going up to someone who you know is going through something and someone you know is comfortable with that form of affection and giving them just a hug, just a sense that you are there physically for them, holding them, is honestly a lot to a lot of people. That hug when you're feeling alone or when you're feeling like nobody's there for you can do wonders, can actually do a lot more than speaking in some situations. So if you are in a situation where you know that person is a very physical person, a hug, some people, maybe even if you hold their hand when you feel like they're being panicky or if there's any, you know, in, like feeling of uneasiness, holding their, their, their hand understanding when they're uncomfortable. Some people might be uncomfortable in certain situations. Some people might have past trauma associated with different individuals, different situations. Un being, if you know of this trauma, if you see them getting uneasy in these certain situations, you volunteering, oh, hey, I will go order that for you. Oh, hey, I will talk to so-and-so for you can be honestly a very big thing to people going through that situation because it makes them feel that you are willing to help them and you are willing to take this burden or this feeling of uneasiness or this um, anxiety or you know past trauma off of their hands and it just overall just makes them feel better so in both situations what you have to do is obviously understand the individual understand the situation and then act accordingly in a way that that human being or that individual is comfortable Thank you so much, Nimaya. There's actually a follow-up question to your statement, which I will ask Adle. Um, so it's obvious that some things we might do might trigger a suicidal person. So my question is, what should you not say to a suicidal individual? Like, what are the things that might trigger a suicidal individual even further? Um, first and foremost, uh, as Nimaya was saying, be non-judgmental when you approach somebody right and and be open and be sensitive be willing to listen uh, things not to do don't disregard what they're going through i know when it comes to mental health or somebody feeling suicidal uh, the tendency to say you know get over it basically why are you being such a drama king or drama queen so don't disregard um, if you really want to help somebody uh, who you think is feeling suicidal uh, as I think Nimaya covered a lot of it of saying, be there for them, be empathetic, be sensitive, listen, give them their space to talk to you and, and don't try to advise them. Don't try to uh, teach them the value of life. Right. At that time, what the best thing you can do is, you know, be there, listen to what they have to say. And sometimes like uh, Nimaya said, if somebody, you know, that you can give them hug or sometimes just sitting next to somebody in silence can, you know, be really helpful. Some people, you know, just being there, knowing that somebody is just there by your side is helpful. So basically, it's uh, take what they're saying seriously. Listen actively. And, and uh, don't try to, I know some people may think it's helpful by trying to, you know, disregard what they're going through of saying, you'll, you'll never do it. Don't talk nonsense. Uh, this is just, you know, another prank of yours. Those kind of things, avoid it. If a person says that they have suicidal thoughts or they are planning to end their life, take it seriously, right? And just be there for them. Listen, be empathetic and understanding. I know it comes from a form of help. Sometimes we try to disregard people's seriousness by making jokes of it. It's not, it's not a joke. So give them that space, be sensitive and non-judgmental. And that alone will do a lot for somebody who's going through something difficult. Thank you, Adle. Um, so, how can we help them there? Like, what advice do we give them? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, hear the question. Just Oh, I'm sorry. Did I cut off? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still returning from work. So right. I'm sorry. I also look like a zombie in the video. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so my question was, what can we do to help someone? What advice do we give to someone who is suicidal? First of all, we don't advise anyone who is suicidal. That's the last thing they want is advice from people. Um, right. As I said before, if somebody is feeling suicidal and you know for a fact they have shared it with you, um, well, don't leave them alone. Uh, offer them the, you know, find out what their supportive systems are. Uh, and if they are willing to, if it is just a thought of suicide and they want to talk to somebody, offer helplines like we discussed earlier from 1333 to Shanti Margam, you know, to grassroots, give them the options. And it's just like more of helping them get through that difficult time that they're going through and knowing and letting them know that you're just going to be there for them. So uh, I, I know again, it comes to intention of wanting to help the person of trying to advise them and tell them not to do it. That's not what they want to hear. They just want to be heard. They want to know that whatever that they're going through is validated. And they just want to know that the other person is listening wholeheartedly right. on the other side. I would like to direct the same question at Prabhashana because I want to know if there's a difference in how you deal with specifically queer people because we don't want to offend them. We don't want them to get triggered. We don't want them to worry about anything that we say. So if we notice someone who is also queer and suicidal, how do you think we can talk to them and how do you think we can help them? Um, in this, um, for that question, I think Nimaya gave the best answer. Just let them know that you're there for them because okay. and and don't tr try to force yourself onto helping because sometimes they they don't really want it they just want to know that there is someone they can count on that's it simply and um i i don't believe there's a, a specific difference maybe one thing you could do is maybe ask uh, are you comfortable with talking about these things or can, what pronouns should I use or what name would you prefer for me to call you? Make them feel comfortable if it is specifically about their gender identity or sexuality. And it's okay to ask them because some people have this um, inherent feeling where like, oh, I might offend them or I should not ask them. But then again, if you don't, you're cutting off communication with this person who who, with a relation who uh, you could um, blossom a good relationship with so I don't really th think other than that there's anything different you could do right thank you so much Prabhashana and I would like to thank all the panelists today for the great discussion uh, these are basically questions that we need answered when it comes to being suicidal and also to help suicidal individuals because at the end of the day, what we want is to reduce the statistics that we got from the 1333 line because that's what we want at the end of the day. And we want to be there for people and there are the people who want others to be there for them. And I think today we discussed a lot about the options that are available and how we can help other people. And also if someone is going through this, the suicidal tendencies, how they can help, help themselves too, and how they're not alone and how there's always, always a way out. So I would like to hand over the mantle to Parami, but before that, I would like to thank the panelists, each and every one of you, thank you so much for everything that you said and for being kind and for being able to help other people, especially in a very a stigmatized situation such as suicide. And I am really, really honored to be here with all of you guys. So thank you. And Parami, over to you. Where's Parami?
Is everything okay? Army is aware that she should be here right now or not? Yeah, no, I'll just, uh, okay, so Parmi just asked me to wrap up the session because she isn't available right now and her audio isn't working, but she's here, she's okay. she's listening. Uh, so thank you, all of you. Thank you, Adli. Thank you, Mr. Anil. Thank you, Prabhashana. Thank you, Nimaya, for joining us today. And it was such an enlightening discussion. Thank you so much for everything that you've said. And as I said before, for working for a very stigmatized situation such as suicide, because not everyone is willing to talk about it and not everyone is willing to do what it takes to prevent it. So thank you so much for all the things that you're doing uh, in order to prevent suicide and in order to help people in Sri Lanka and to reduce the stigma related to this subject. So thank you everyone and have a good night and a great weekend. Hopefully, thank you, thank you, thank you, and you too. for answering okay. uh, for planning this. Yeah, and uh, thank you, uh, Mihi and Parami for getting this together. And uh, thanks, guys, for being here. Thank it was you wonderful so much. wonderful getting to know about all of you, uh, especially uh, Nimaya and Prabhashana. Uh, I run it, I already know. So nice seeing that you guys, so young, are doing so much. So wonderful work. Thank you so much, Adley. Thank okay, you, everybody, for Bye. being here. Take care, everyone, and have a good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>